In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted.
begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who am I? Well, if you don't recognize me from around here, my name is Mark Reichert. I'm the new pastor installed at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Beaver Dam. Thankful to be here doing this with you today as we look at a couple more parts of the liturgical worship service called the Kyrie and the Gloria. Now, who are you? Well, that's a question that we started to answer as we looked at the confession and absolution in the worship service. You are a sinner who deserves God's punishment both now and in eternity. What a humbling truth. But you are also a forgiven child of God and an heir of eternal life in his heavenly kingdom. What an uplifting truth. In the confession and absolution, you come face to face with who you really are. And now in these next portions of the worship service, we're going to begin to answer the question, who is God? Kyrie is a Greek word that comes from the phrase Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Christians have been praying this prayer in word and song for the last 1,700 years in their worship. This is the heartfelt cry of believers to their Lord that he would hear us and take away our sins and help us in all of our needs and troubles. Have you ever noticed that in different orders of service in different hymnals, the Kyrie sometimes come in different parts of the service? Sometimes it's before the absolution. Sometimes it's after the absolution. Sometimes it's even at the prayers that we speak after the sermon. The Kyrie can serve lots of different purposes depending on where and in what context it comes. But its placement in the service is less important than the attitude that drives it. It's an attitude of humble repentance. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus told the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus told about a Pharisee who came to the temple. He came to God and he prayed about how great he was and how much better he was than everyone else who was around him. Well, Jesus says, what an abomination that kind of attitude is before a holy God. How can sinful human beings ever come before the Lord so arrogant and braggy? It should never be that way. Now, Jesus says the way for us to come before our God is like the tax collector did that day. Jesus says he stood at a distance because he knew he wasn't worthy to come any closer. He wouldn't even look up to heaven because he was so ashamed. And he beat his breast in sorrow over his sin. And he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's how we come before God, even now too, in every time we gather in his house for worship. Because just like that tax collector, we know that we need the kind of help for our lives and eternities that only God can give. So we ask for mercy. That's one of those church words that's it's important for us to define together so we can know exactly what we're asking for here. Mercy and grace are really two sides of the same coin. If you remember your old catechism definition of grace, you remember that it's undeserved love. It's when God gives us the good things that we don't deserve because of our sins. Well, mercy means asking God to not give us the bad things that we do deserve because of our sins. And that's not just true for our spiritual lives and our relationship with Him. It's also true for every part of our earthly lives. Every day here as we deal with the ongoing effects of sin inside of us and all around us. And and who can help but feel helpless against those effects right now in this climate of cancellations and closures and fears over the coronavirus? That and a thousand other things that are totally outside of our control make it sometimes painfully clear to us how much we need God's mercy every day. So we pray and we sing, Kyrie eleison, because this much our God has promised to us in his word about who he is. The Lord who is our all-powerful God is also the Christ 
who is our all-merciful Savior. If anyone can help, if we dare approach anyone for help, if we can trust anyone to help, it's him. And how can we be sure of that? Well, because he proved it by sending his one and only Son to be one of us and to be one with us. On that night our Lord Jesus was born into this world, God's angels sang out, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. That's recorded in Luke chapter 2. The Latin words that begin that short phrase of praise are gloria in excelsis. And that's the name we still give to this song of praise that Christians have been singing in their worship services for the last 1,500 years. Martin Luther once said about the Gloria, this ancient song did not grow, nor was it made, but it came from heaven. We give glory to God in the highest, in the highest heavens, in the greatest of ways, because he is the God who fills them all. We give glory to God in the highest, because this is how he chose to answer our prayers for mercy, by sending his one and only son from heaven to be our substitute, to be our sacrifice, and to be our Savior. And that's why in the same breath that we call him here, Lord God and Son of the Father, we remember also that Jesus came to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as John the Baptist said. You see, back in the days of the temple, lambs had really only one purpose, to be sacrificed at the altar in Jerusalem for the sins of the people. Well, Jesus, he was God's true Lamb of God, the one who has sacrificed once for all to forgive my sins and your sins on the altar of the cross. Only that way could our sins be paid for and done away with. Only that way could our sin-broken relationship with God be fixed. Only that way can we receive from our Heavenly Father grace and mercy only this way could we be turned from enemies of God into his dearly loved children now. And only this way could he give us his goodwill and peace, that peace of forgiveness that Jesus won for us and here delivers to us. Just like those angels sang on that first Christmas night and just like we still sing in the glory of the day. The Kyrie and the Gloria, they begin to answer that question of who our God is by beginning to recount the story of who our Savior Jesus is. And throughout the rest of the worship service, we not only remember that he was born for us, but we also remember that he lived for us, that he died for us, that he rose for us, and that he even now still reigns for us as well. The Kyrie reminds us that our God alone is holy. But the Gloria reminds us that he came here to share that holiness with us. Before our God, we bow low in humble repentance so that he can lift us back up in the glory and joy of his salvation. The Lord of law and gospel, that's who our God is. And that's the God that we worship in the divine service. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart 
that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Thank you.